welcome to our third lung and heart lung transplant patient family advisory council virtual town hall. My name is Elise Elconen Goldberg, and I am eight and a half years post a double lung transplant. And I also co chair the lung and heart lung patient family advisory council. Today, we have four exciting speakers that will be discussing the transition we are entering as COVID-19 precautions start to be lifted and we begin living in the new normal. We will be addressing the transition to the new normal from a post-transplant and a mental health perspective. We also have the opportunity today to hear from Matt Defina, a patient who has gone through two double lung transplants, who will share his transplant journey with us. Our hope is that you will find the information presented by our panelists interesting and helpful as we move forward to navigating the new normal. I would now like to introduce my co-chair, Bob Duffy, who will introduce our upcoming speakers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bob Duffy. I'm a co-chair of the Lung and Heart Lung PFAC and a double lung transplant recipient myself, almost four and a half years post. Along with Elise and the rest of the PFAC team, I'd like to welcome you all to this virtual town hall and to thank our speakers for sharing their time with us today. Our first speaker is Dr. Gundeep Dillon, Medical Director for the Adult Lung and Heart Lung Transplant Program at Stanford. We're all looking forward to hearing his comments. And at this time, I'd like to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Dillon. Thank you, Bob. Hi, I'm Gundeep Dillon. I'm one of the lung transplant physicians at Stanford. I think I know most of the people on this call. Um, again, I want to thank PFAC for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to talk today. Um, I just wanted to give an update on the program and then I'll turn over to Dr. Nelson and Dr. Sher about the, you know, the, about the, for the real topic. You know, as far as the program goes, I think last two years we have been very busy. I mean, both in 2020 and 2021, we've done over 65 transplants. Traditionally, we have done about 40 transplants a year. So there has been this clearly a big jump in our, our transplant volumes. As a result, you know, we have been very busy. And I'm sure some of you have noticed that. Um, and as far as the impact of COVID on our program, you know, we are probably one of the major centers who have done transplants for COVID related lung disease. Um, we have, to date, we have done 14 transplants and that represented about 14 to 15% of our lung volumes in 2021. Nationally, that number is close to about 8%, about 8% of the transplants being done are for COVID related lung disease. Um, as far as how, how we are dealing with this increase in volume, as well as increase in severity of illness of patients who are getting transplanted, um, we have really tried to grow the program as far as staffing is concerned. As SHC, which is Stanford Healthcare, they have been great partners in this. You know, they have allowed us to hire more AP nurse practitioners, as well as coordinators. And we are up to five post coordinators and three pre coordinator coordinators, and uh, and we are soon will be up to eight, um, eight nurse practitioners in our program. Um, more on the physician, and you know, some of you may know, Dr. Ahmad has decided to move back to East Coast for family reasons, so he'll be transitioning back in, in at the end of this academic year, which is like June. And, but we are actively recruiting for two more physicians and we have been able to recruit one and she will be starting in hopefully in, by July of this year. And you will all will, will be very pleased. She's a very, somebody who's very senior and very well known in the field. Um, and then we are actively interviewing for the second position. So you will see some new faces around the program. So that's the only updates I had, and I can either take questions now or at the end of it, if there's any program related questions. Otherwise I'll hand over the podium to Dr. Nelson. Okay, well then uh, thank you, Dr. Dillon. Um, 
actually, I think on our schedule, our next uh, speaker is uh, actually Dr. Yelizaveta Sher, psychiatrist and clinical associate professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences. Uh, she specializes in the mental health of patients with cystic fibrosis, as well as lung and heart transplant patients. So now we'll turn it over to Dr. Sher. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it was definitely, you know, I really appreciate it talking to everybody last year and very happy to be invited back. The topic that I was asked to talk about is new lungs, new life, new outlook on life. Uh, and while I will be of course talking about COVID as well, but I think I'll be painting the picture for lung transplant recipients, uh, no matter of the, you know, being in the pandemic or not, just thinking about trajectory in general. And this is not gonna be so much a fact or you know, research or paper-based talk. This is really talk you know, kind of combining my mental health uh, perspective and expertise with multiple stories and themes that I have been able to observe over the last nine years that I've actually worked with the lung transplant community at Stanford, for which I'm very appreciative. So I see, you know, many, what I'm really actually appreciative about Stanford, and I think it's a great program, is how much mental health is actually appreciated and integrated. I want to say that only the other day I was actually talking to UCSF team who reached out to ask what we do about their mental health because they realized that they need to do more. So I was very happy to kind of show off what we've been doing here. So I really appreciate Dr. Dr. Dylan and everybody appreciating the mental health component of this. So whenever I see anybody for pre-lung transplant evaluation, be it an overall psychosocial evaluation or evaluation for anxiety or depression, I always stress that lung transplantation is as much of a psychological experience as it is a physical one. And I think we sort of, we know that, but I don't think we stress that enough. Um, this affects, right? It, it affects your whole life, right? Your whole being, your whole system. And it really, it starts with a diagnosis, be it at birth or later in life and continues right throughout this process. Somebody might be diagnosed, right? They're living the life and all of a sudden they're diagnosed with a new condition, right? ILD or COPD, right? And of course that brings a lot of questions and emotions and processing. Or somebody else, of course, might have been living with a chronic condition like cystic fibrosis from the beginning, right? It's sort of, it, it, you know, in some level, like this is part of, you know, what they have to do to stay healthy, right? And of course it has influence, right? Who have they become as, as people to some extent? Versus we're thinking about even now new, you know, our recipients due to lung failure because of the COVID, right? Usually these are more or less healthy people, right? If the candidates to get to lung transplant and now this terrible thing has happened, right? One trauma and now all of a sudden they're going through transplantation, right? At that point, of course, they, you know, usually in ICU. But whenever the diagnosis is happening, right, then you live with this usually, right, progressive chronic illness, right? That changes you, that changes what you're able to do and how you connect with others. And then at some point you refer to transplant. There's, then there is an evaluation. We know how stressful that week is, right? Meaning all the clinicians and doctors and social workers and doing all the tests. It's a very emotional experience. Then finally you made it, you were placed right on the list. And then all of a sudden, you know, sort of it's exciting. Probably you want to be there, but then there is this weight in limbo, right? What happens from now, right? You have to be attached to the phone all the time. Is it going to happen today? Is it going to happen in a year? There's a lot of uncertainty. The call happens. I'm sure everybody here, um, unless of course you and I see you and you're sedated, will remember when that call has happened for them, right? I'm sure you can kind of, and as I'm saying this right now, you can probably exactly recollect right what was happening in the moment. Immediate recovery, lots of emotions happening during the time, and we'll talk about that. Long term, right? Just kind of then living, right? You have traded one chronic condition for another chronic condition. Hopefully, you're living longer, you're living better life. There's a better quality, but you have to maintain it, right? It, it affects it, it affects your life. Complications might come up, right? How do you cope and deal with those? But I, what I want to stress that throughout all of this, right? Throughout all of these challenges and emotions and adaptations, th this is actually a period of significant psychological and existential processing and growth. And sometimes we don't, don't appreciate that, right? But if we kind of really listen to that and think about, you know, about the growth and the, that's happening during this incredible life experiences, I think that actually can help us, right? With that new outlook, 
right? It was kind of really understanding where am I right now, right? And how can I make the best out of life that I have right now, right? Appreciating that growth. And that's actually, you know, even in the transplant literature, right? Often, often in mental health, right? We focus on challenges and illnesses and diseases and pathologizing. I right? would talk about uh, post-transplant PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but there's also such thing as post-traumatic growth, right? Post-transplant growth. So just really zooming in on through the stress, through the difficult emotions, through the suffering, there is a lot of growth and meaning. And I think that's important to also really accent, accent for us. Facing transplantation is facing mortality. And kind of an existential psychiatrist, I actually don't say that grimly. I don't know if when I'm facing, I'll be honest, when I'm facing my mortality, all my wisdom will hold up for me personally, right? But I think, you know, that there's, well, this is the time where while there is a lot of grief, right? Often we don't think about, kind of it's all abstract, right? Most of people walk through life, they assume they're not gonna die today. Right? But when you're so close to transplant, right, you're faced to really literally face your mortality, right? There is grief through that. And again, there is growth, right? Things all of a sudden, maybe some as painful as this period is, there are things that you might be realizing, or what's important for you is now being crystallized for you, right? Priorities might be reshifted. Some of the views might be changed. It might be important to make some plans. Sometimes plans for the very end, right? And what I've see often, right? When people truly are able to kind of, and I really respect and admire that a lot, really face and accept their mortality and even make unnecessary plans, really what it does, then it helps you to concentrate and be back in the present and live your best life, right? So again, I look at the facing mortality as this really existential process of growth. Um, when we talked about the immediate recovery and the emotions that come up, right, kind of as we're approaching this new outlook, often when I see people, especially within the first year, right, and early on, they're asking me, what am I supposed to feel? I'm feeling all of this. Is this normal? I don't know how to cope or how to feel or what to do, right, was this process. And, and you know, there is no right way to feel, right? Going through transplant is a unique experience, and every one of you, right, and everybody else has a unique journey but it's unique and it's valid. And there's a variety of emotions that you can feel or you might not feel any of them or you might feel them all at the same time or one might quickly change the other, right? All of this is normal. And in fact, I wanna say, right? That feelings are normal, right? I think of feelings as our sixth sense, right? It's the way just as a taste and, and our hearing and sensation, our feelings connect us with ourselves and with the outside world. And they tell us what's going on. So it's important to listen to our feelings, right? So you might feel shock, right? Just especially when you just got a transplant and you're recovering and you're sitting up and you're breathing with your new lungs and you might be shocked or numb and that might be okay, right? Often shock and numb is actually protective defensive mechanisms, right? When you really, this is not the time maybe to process for you, the emotional gravity was happening, right? So you're just there to just to, to focus on the physical but other feelings will come later. There might be grief, right? Grief, you know, even though again, there's a lot of elation and happiness, but there also might be grief, right? Of what grieving what life might have been like. For some people, for example, especially people who have lived for a long time with a chronic illness like cystic fibrosis, there's a whole community, right? And support and doctors and routines and way of life and just knowing your body, right? Your lungs with CF and sort of letting go of that, right? Also might be actually a transitional period. So there might be grief for that grief for the donor, right? So there's going to be a lot of grief during that process, right? Grief for your family, just grief that this is where you are. Uh, sadness, confusion, right? Anger, there might be survival's guilt, right? Again, either, you know, because of thinking about other people who are on the list or again, thinking about the donor. There might be gratitude, right? Just really feeling that demands gratitude or there might not be gratitude, right? There might be ambivalence about it. Sometimes I have people who tell me it's like, I, I know that I should be feeling grateful because, right, society tells me it's a gift, but I just don't feel that because my life is so hard. I still have a lot of things to do um, to take care of my body. I still have these complications and that's okay, right? Whatever you feel, it's okay as long as you're paying attention to that, right, and understand what it means for you. There might be fear, right, fear of what's happening right now or later. Worry, anxiety, hypervigilance, and of course, hope and excitement, right? So variety of feelings, all feelings are normal, right? There's really no wrong feelings. It's just really about, we'll talk about it later, about sort of the degree, right? And comparing them, the feelings and your thought processes and kind of reality testing 
how in Siuna Day with what's what you know with what's really happening right now, or are they a little bit the feelings are a bit maybe too hot, right? And then maybe we can kind of talk more about that. So then kind of as we start, right, as you start adapting, right, and changing with your new life, with the new lungs, right, people change with transplantation, maybe some more than others, right? But, you know, your, your life is different. The relationships might change. For example, partners, right, equal partners. And so now, you know, before the transplant, after the transplant, this equal partnership might have shifted more into, or likely it would have shifted more into like patient caregiver, right? So responsibilities are not divided equally. And then as you are getting better from the transplantation, then again, there is a change, right? Trying to get back into that equal, right? Partnership, but even that might be challenging, right? So relationships will undergo evolution as well, right? Kind of an adapting to these new roles might be stressful and challenging. Your abilities might change. Your interests might change, right? Pri again, priorities might change, right? What you were doing before might just not be as important to you right now, or you might not be able to do this right now, or you might not want to do this right now, right? And especially with the COVID, right? Of course, the pandemic, and with new infectious risks, it might carry more risks, right? So then how do you adapt to that and live with that? Do you go back to work, right? What kind of work, right, do you do, right? Are you able to go back to work? Again, you know, in terms of the parenting, I think a lot of parents, especially kind of new transplant recipients, right, and those younger kids, really juggling, right, and you know, being challenged even more, right, with parenting. It's good for kids to go back to school, right. Of course, they've been in school, right, and see their friends with their emotional and social development. But then you realize that there is even more risk to you potentially, right, for bringing the virus back home. How do you, right? Then kind of how do you focus those priorities? of emotional social development with your children and your own medical right, health and safety. Those are hard decisions. Um, body changes, right? Of course, there's sort of mind changes and body changes on the inside, obviously, and also on the outside, right? The scars, maybe the body weight or habitus, um, uh, facial changes, especially in the first year. So that also might be kind of playing into how you're looking at yourself and representing yourself to the world. And then of course, right, there's ongoing need for close medical follow-up and time requirements, time required for that. Um, you probably likely have traded, right? You probably, you know, you have traded a chronic, one chronic condition for another chronic condition, right? Hopefully you're healthy and you feel better, but you need to be in close contact with your doctors, right? You're not cured and released, right? Now this is your community. This is part of your family, that's it. Or, for example, right, if you think about somebody with, you know, who has a lung failure due to COVID, right, likely were healthy overall, more or less probably healthy before, and now this, this traumatic, right, COVID diagnosis, stay in the hospital, and now, right, they come out of the hospital with new lungs and have to get used to this idea of intense, right, chronic medical condition, right? How do you deal with that? How do you adapt to that new life, right, and process the sort of like double trauma? These are people who probably have not had actually as much time. Well, they probably they likely you did not do not have time, right? As somebody with cystic fibrosis, ILD, hyper, you know, pulmonary hypertension, CPD to process, right? What it means to live with lung transplant. It sort of happens. The processing happens afterwards. So then, how do you live, right? The new, which is really old, but just a bit chan, you know, crystallized life, right? whether it's in the pandemic right now, right? Or kind of adapting to, and Dr. Nelson will talk more about it, to new rules, right? To new mutations, to new mask mandates, so lack of, the, of those, or just living post-transplant, right? And I think really the secret, that's the secret for really for all of us. I don't think it's anything unique, right? To being a lung transplant recipient. I think this is just really a secret probably to being human, right? It's really balancing. Right? It's the balance between having long-term goals right, and wanting more, wanting to improve the things that you think you can improve, right? desiring more from life, and balancing that, living your each day to the best of your ability, right? kind of appreciating what is right now. Right? It's sort of like this you know, seesaw between the gratitude for now right? and, I, and dedicating myself, I'm going to you know, commit myself to live my best day right now, no matter what's happening whether I'm outside of the hospital, whether I'm in the hospital, even in ICU, right? Versus striving for more, right? And, and it's gonna change, right? That's gonna change. There's, 
you know, and it's going to be so unique to each one of you. But just thinking about it, what more do I want, right? What are my goals? How do I get there? Uh, and then right now, how can I live my best life right now? Right. So probably with the pandemic, it means, right, your health is important to you. So you're probably not going to run to the supermarket and like hug and, you know, kiss every stranger you see there because it's just not consistent with the medical safety. Right. But at the same time, thinking, what can you do today, right, to enjoy nature, to, to enjoy your loved ones, right, who are hopefully vaccinated, right? And sort of the balance, right? Long term and now, best day today and planning for the future. And that's different. That's different for everybody and different where we are in our life. So, but again, I would encourage you to work towards the future, make plans, set goals. And at the same time, every day create space, right? For something important and meaningful and pleasurable, right? Because pleasure and leisure are important and they're not wasting time. They're part of life and they're integral to our well being. So, then if we talk about kind of how do we get there and right? just kind of what are most our con concrete tools, right? In terms of the coping tools and strategies and attitudes going back to the feelings, right? We wanna feel our feelings, they're important. They communicate to us important things about ourselves and the world around us. We wanna pay attention to our thoughts, right? Associated with our feelings, kind of listen in, right? Um, what's going on in our mind. And sometimes we might recognize some, what we call the cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive distortions, right? The thinking traps, not necessarily, but maybe, right? Am I thinking, right? You, oh, I went to the grocery store, that's it. I'm just going to get sick, right? And die from COVID, right? Kind of, oh, that's probably catastrophizing, right? I would point that out, right? So kind of how do we, you, you know, pay attention to our thoughts, right? And be cognizant of those thinking traps that all of us fall into. We want to validate the feelings, right? But pay attention to the thermostat, right? Kind of how hot are they? Are they a bit too hot for our thoughts? And we want to remind ourselves always of our strength and resilience, you know, everybody who's calling in here has been through something. Each one of you has incredible story and all of you have incredible strength and resilience. So really reminding yourself every day that is important. Focus on what's possible. What are you hopeful for? What is meaningful today, right? Today, after transplant, with the pandemic, there are things that are possible and great and meaningful right now in your life, right? And what can you hope for for the future? And stay flexible, right? As things change, obviously, post-transplant, within the pandemic, we have to stay flexible. We want to be also gentle and compassionate with ourselves, right? Like we want to talk to ourselves the way we would talk, like the most sort of, you know, wise parent would talk to their child, right? This is how we want to talk to ourselves. There are some very concrete tools in terms of, you know, when you're overwhelmed, what you can do to sort of to bring yourself down, such as using relaxation practices, right? Guided imagery or mindfulness, progressive muscle relaxation. There are great apps. You can look, look these things up on YouTube. But the idea is that, you know, when you really feel overwhelmed, right? Just bring yourself into here and now, right? Here and now. And then doing what we call gratitude or catching joy exercise, right? Again, I have kind of, you know, especially within the trust community, I, I, I find that sometimes gratitude is a bit of, it's a word that's sort of like, eh, kind of prickly, right? It's like, it can kind of trigger some emotions, but I should be, feel gratitude that I don't. So, but catching joy, I think is a good, um, you know, reframing, right? Just what, think about what feels good today, right? So far, like I really enjoyed my cup of coffee, right? So just those little small things, because that's actually what makes, right, the contented life. And again, I'm sure the kind of just this ideas overall, right? What brings you meaning, right? Just today, can you journal? Can you be in nature? Read, listen to books and music, watch fun shows, right? Stay active with your body and whatever, whatever that means for you, right? It's so different, but, it, but we all can be, most of us, right? 99% of us can be physically active in some way. Work or volunteer, right? If that's something that is consistent with your goals and abilities and needs help others, right? Kind of really looking outside of ourselves is really helpful. Uh, and it can be just calling somebody or texting somebody, right? Reaching out in some way, patting your dog. I'm sure dog would appreciate that. It makes you feel good, right? Connecting with your family and friends, with your loved ones, right? Or religious community, whatever the supports you have around you. Peers and larger community, right? Like what we're doing right now, right? Connecting with others. Because of course, like learning from each other. So I think it's like the most, one of the most important tools here. And reaching out to your medical and mental health professionals, right, when there is a need. I've, I've talked about kind of more normal, expensive, normal psychological and social experience, but of course, right, there are also mental health challenges that can come up, right? 
depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, they can be cognitive challenges post-transplant. So this, or the caregivers, right, who are such an important part of this community, right, they can be burned out, right? They need additional support. They might have other mental, mental health challenges. So reaching out to your mental health professionals, that's part of the coping, that's part of doing well, right? That's part of taking care of yourself. But I also want to say, you don't need to be clinically depressed or terribly anxious or having the most severe case of PTSD to reach out to a mental health professional. I'm biased, but I think anybody would benefit from talking right to a therapist and processing your experience and really appreciating all the richness of it. And sometimes kind of having this additional witness in your life. So think about it, that can be an incredible support. I wanna end sort of with the catching joy exercise, right? So I want everybody right now just to think, right? So I want everybody to think, what are those three things today that you've done so far? Little things that brought you joy, that helped, that kind of felt good to you or were meaningful. Just think about that. And then, mm -hmm. right? Because sometimes we just don't even recognize that joy that exists in our life, right? I mean, I can tell you for me, part of it was cooking. I was pre-making lunch and listening to an audio book, which I love, right? And I was in the moment, I didn't need anything else in that moment. And it's, I, I think often part of this like that mindfulness is just being in the moment. I was really enjoying um, listening to Obama, his book, finally I got to that, and I was cooking, and that's it. Like, I didn't need anything else. It just felt good, right? And when you kind of recognize that, then you think about how can you have more of this in your life, right? Sometimes it's just thinking about and expanding more of it, right, and kind of carrying this into the new life and to the new outlook. That's all that I have for today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Cher, uh, for those wonderful comments. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Joanna Nelson, physician and clinical assistant professor in infectious disease. She has a special interest in caring for patients with cystic fibrosis or who have had a lung transplant, as well as non-tuberculous mycobacteria infections. So now would you please welcome Dr. Nelson. Thanks very much, Bob. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so thanks. Um, thanks also for the invite. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you all um, last year and was happy to come back. Um, as Bob mentioned, I'm one of the infectious disease doctors and I work really closely with the lung transplant team. And um, I'm gonna be talking about some COVID updates from the infectious disease perspective. Um, tried my best to um, kind of answer or touch on most of the questions posed of me in this regard. So just to review, um, you know, we've really been in this pandemic for two years and we have come a long way. Uh, this is a graph of the levels of virus in um, our county, Santa Clara County, um, over this time. And you can see the, the initial kind of bump um, or the middle bump there was uh, Delta variant uh, last year. And then most recently we had another bump um, and that was related to the Omicron variant. And fortunately um, we've been on the downswing um, over the last few weeks. So I just wanted to touch a little bit on variants because um, this is one of the questions that that um, comes to me sometimes. So, you know, how, how this happens, it's actually very, very common for viruses to mutate. And they often mutate as they replicate. Uh, so sometimes these mutations result in a new variant of the virus. And that's basically if there's enough mutations um, to make um, a new variant that looks different enough, it will, be called a new variant, which for COVID has, um, you know, a, um, a letter associated with it. Some variants emerge and then disappear, but those variants that um, provide some benefit to the virus tend to persist. Um, so for example, when Omicron um, developed, it, it was quite, uh, you know, more infectious. So um, that kind of allowed it to persist um, in, in the community. Because um, these mutations happen as the virus replicates, 
really stopping the spread of virus is the thing that can prevent um, an, uh, new variants from popping up or you know, prevent, uh, decrease this chance for mutation. Uh, you can see on the right here, this is the percentage of variants in the US over time. So late last year, um, we all know Delta was the predominant variant. In November, it was um, you know, nearly 100% of cases. And then as we came into January of 2022, um, the Omicron variant, which is purple, um, started to take over and now it's the dominant uh, variant. So how about, um, this had come up in um, the press, you know, a little ways back in, in terms of, you know, how, how are immunocompromised patients um, kind of a part of this um, development of variants? And um, this came about because of some reports um, in the literature of patients who are immunocompromised and um, who happen to have very long durations of their COVID, much longer than normal, um, like greater than 100 days, where um, teams and scientists noticed that multiple mutations occurred in these people. Um, and so it was hypothesized that could, could the virus develop a new variant in um, an immunocompromised host? This is somewhat um, you know, theoretical. And I think um, you know, based on, on seeing this occur in a few rare patients, um, it could be possible, but to me, I think um, taking into account kind of the spread of virus and just the amount of virus replicating in the community um, is probably more important than um, just this small subset of a few rare people. But I think it does highlight that you know, all the more reason to try to keep our um, immunocompromised friends um, and selves um, as safe and healthy as we can. So a little bit more about the Omicron variant, um, which is with us currently. So it does spread very easily, um, even more so than the Delta variant. Um, it does not appear to make people sicker than other COVID variants that have previously circulated in our community which is good. Um, it is the case that asymptomatic or vaccinated people can still spread this variant. Um, and we do know that current vaccines are expected to protect against severe illness, hospitalizations and death due to infection with the Omicron variant, even if people can still have um, some breakthrough infection if they're vaccinated. You may have heard a little bit more about this new um, Omicron subtype, BA2, so I just wanted to mention that. So as I mentioned before, if there's replicating virus in the community, we are gonna have new variants come up. New variants will continue to emerge. This is the latest, the BA2. It's a subtype of Omicron, the original, which is known as BA1. Um, and the reason it's a subtype is because there's some mutations to make it slightly different but it's not different enough to have a new letter um, and be considered an, um, a completely new variant. It does um, appear to be more infectious than BA1. Um, and currently about 4% of the cases in COVID cases in the US are from this variant. Um, it's hard to know, um, you know uh, what exactly, uh, what part this will play. Um, in the future, but there are some countries um, in the world who um, uh, you know, are dealing with this new variant uh, more so than us at this time. So that's you know, a little lay in the land in terms of uh, what the virus is doing, but um, maybe a little more uplifting. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about some updates you know, that have changed since the past year about new things we know about what we can do to treat and prevent the virus that I think is important for everybody to know. 
So first of all, to go through treatment for mild disease. So this is if you know you have some symptoms, but you don't need to be in the hospital. Um, and I think the most important thing to realize is that these therapies are really the most efficacious the, early, the earlier you get them. Um, so early administration after symptom onset is really ideal um, for them to be um, uh, the most efficacious uh, as they can. And all these therapies I'm gonna talk about have been shown to reduce the incidence of hospitalization and death in high-risk patients. Um, so patients who have at least one risk factor, and that includes um, people who are immunocompromised. So I like to break them down into two classes. Um, the first is, is passive immunity. So that's usually through um, monoclonal antibody therapy. So basically giving, administering to you some antibodies against COVID uh, to help you fight, fight off the virus that's in your system. And currently, um, the only, uh, well, I should say, the only monoclonal antibody available as treatment that has activity against Omicron is one called sotrivimab. So that's the one we've been using. Um, it's given as a one-time dose of an intravenous therapy, and it's ideal for it to be given within the first seven days of symptoms. There can be some, um, that's kind of how it was approved. There can be some uh, leeway there. So um, uh, you know, the team can help anybody work through any of that, but again, it's ideal to be given as early as possible. And then there's also antivirals that worked directly on the virus. And uh, the first of these is called Paxlovid. This probably out of, um, out of all the antivirals has um, the uh, slight um, kind of the best efficacy, um, but they're all, they're all fairly good. Uh, this is given as a five-day oral course, um, and it's ideal to be administered within five days of symptom onset. Important to realize that it does have a um, significant interaction with tacrolimus. Um, so if you were to get this, the team would probably stop your tacrolimus for a little while um, and also monitor your levels really closely. I suspect that most people, if being treated, would be treated you know, by the lung transplant team, but just, um, just important to realize if you happen to um, live far away or are gonna be treated by a primary care doctor um, that you would wanna let the team know so they can make sure your levels are monitored well. Another antiviral um, that we use is called remdesivir. This is um, used in the hospital, but now also approved um, for outpatient use for mild disease. It's given as a three-day course of intravenous therapy. Again, we want to administer it within the first seven days of symptom onset. And the last is called malnupiravir. Um, and this, I would say, um, is probably our, um, our fourth choice out of all the rest. Um, um, the efficacy of the others are a little bit better, but um, also can be helpful if um, it's the only available therapy. So it's an oral course administered within five days of symptom onset. So in terms of logistics of all this, um, that's an uh, you know, ever moving target, but um, uh, you know, right now at Stanford, um, we are giving uh, sotrimumab and we are giving um, remdesivir. This is um, through an infusion center um, uh, set up uh, specifically for these therapies. Um, sotrimumab, is limited overall in the country, but we have not had issues um, in terms of, um, you know, we do um, have definitely enough drug at this time to give people who need it. Um, in terms of, um, you know, coordination and choice of therapy, really the most important thing for you to do is just reach out to the team and then we can help, um, help get you the therapy that's needed. So if you're hospitalized, the treatment is a little different, and this is mostly, um, you know, based on uh, how these drugs are studied in, in, in different areas. So that's kind of, they're approved based on um, the positive effect they have shown. Um, so these were the drugs um, that have shown to have a positive effect in the, in the hospital. So the first is remdesivir, and that's usually given as a five-day course in the hospital. Um, 
Second is steroids, and this these work to um, you know as immunomodulators. So um, often people who develop severe complications from COVID, it's the virus itself, but it's also the inflammation that comes um, as a result of the virus. So the steroids work to target that. And passive immunity can also be used um, by giving antibodies against COVID. Right now, um, there's not monoclonal antibodies available to be used in the hospital because so um is so limited um, and scarce. That may change um, in the future, but currently um, we have sometimes been giving people what's called high titer convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma is actually um, plasma from patients who have had COVID um, in the past. And our lab does um, an extra step to actually make sure that there's very high levels of uh, COVID specific antibody in the plasma, and then it can be given um, to patients as a treatment. So we've been doing um, that as well. And then of course, supportive care. Um, over the past two years, um, we uh, have learned a lot about um, kind of the best way to, to um, treat other aspects of care in addition to targeting the virus uh, itself. I'll touch briefly on um, what people should be doing for quarantine. So over the past few months, I guess, the CDC has kind of changed their guidance overall for immunocompetent people in terms of how long you need to stay home after you've been infected. For immunocompromised people, I think um, the, our recommendation really is still the same. And the reason for this is that we know that um, it is possible for somebody who's immunocompromised to shed the virus for longer. So you probably do remain infectious for longer than someone with a normal immune system. So it is recommended that you stay home and avoid contact with others for 20 days after your first symptoms develop. And I just put in a caveat here that, you know, we do have some specialized testing at Stanford that we can do. Um, so if you're somebody who still seems to have your COVID symptoms after 20 days, um, uh, there, there is some, some specialized testing we can do to, to look for um, the presence of active replicating virus, um, which probably would be prudent, for example, before um, uh, you're coming back into clinic or something like that. So feel free to... Um, you know, reach out in those special circumstances if you have questions. So switching to prevention, um, and one important um, part of this is vaccination. So all lung transplant recipients and family members and caregivers should receive a primary series and booster. So this, of course, has evolved over time and um, wanted to clarify numbers of doses, et cetera, et cetera. So for immunocompetent individuals, the primary series includes two doses. And then um, it's also recommended for everybody to have gotten those two doses plus a booster. And I guess I'm speaking uh, specifically about Moderna or Pfizer. Um, for immunocompromised individuals, the primary series um, includes three doses. And this really um, is based on some data um, looking at vaccine effectiveness in solid organ transplant patients. So you can see in this graph that, um, you know, before the first dose of vaccine, not surprisingly, nobody has antibodies against COVID. After one dose, um, about, um, you know, less than 10% of patients had detectable antibodies. After two doses, more like 35 uh, plus percent of patients had detectable antibodies. But after three doses, this number went up to about 65% of patients having detectable antibodies. So certainly still not perfect, but better. Um, so that's why the recommendation was changed for all um, solid organ transplant and immunocompromised patients to have a three dose um, series as part of their primary series for COVID. So this is the CDC guidance in summary. And actually this is hot off the presses, um, recently changed um, 
last week, just in terms of timing of everything. So this is putting it all together. Um, if you're somebody who's gotten the Pfizer vaccine, you should get um, three doses as part of your primary, primary series with the second dose three weeks after the first and the third dose at least four weeks after the second. And then after that three dose series, you should get a booster, which we, we commonly refer to as the fourth dose. And that should be given at least three months after the third dose. This recently changed. It uh, used to be at least five months after the third dose. And it's similar for the Moderna um, series. You should get three doses for your primary series. Um, and then one booster, uh, which is the fourth dose, at least three months after your third dose of your series. And if you got initially the J&J &J Janssen vaccine, which I think was not terribly common um, amongst um, our clinic, um, it's changed to where now it's recommended that you get a two dose primary series, which is the first dose J&J, &J, second dose Pfizer or Moderna given at least four weeks after the first, and then um, one booster um, at least two months later of either Pfizer or Moderna. Um, there, we do now have another mode of prevention and this is through the monoclonal antibody called Evishield. And the goal of this, um, this is the, the only, I guess, monoclonal antibody approved as what's called pre-exposure prophylaxis. So the goal of this is really to reduce um, someone who is high risk for infection and complications, reduce the risk of COVID-19 infection. Um, and, and this is not recommended for people who are recently exposed or are currently infected, but really um, somebody who does not have a recent exposure but remains high risk um, in the future. And it's administered as two separate consecutive IM injections. So you can see the two vials here. It's really one, um, one antibody in each. Um, they're given at the same time, which is two different shots. And this is approved um, late last year based on um, the clinical trial that showed high-risk patients who received Evashield had a 77% reduced risk of developing COVID-19. And this um, was a reduction in both symptomatic infections and severe infections. The, the other um, nice thing about this is the protection lasts for at least six months. Um, and it is important to know, however, that um, it does have very good activity against the Delta variant, slightly less effective against the Omicron variant, but it still does have activity, um, protective activity, neutralizing activity. So, you know, I think, um, I think it's, a, it's a great tool we have, um, but important to know that it's not kind of a, um, not uh, a silver bullet, not, not the only answer, still kind of have to be um, careful um, to prevent, prevent infection. So, you know, I think because of the, of the positive, um, positive effect that has been shown um, in terms of preventing the virus with, with Evashield, um, that, you know, we, we're recommending that everybody get it. Um, all lung transplant, lung transplant patients are eligible and should receive it. Um, there's been change over time in terms of whether, you know, initially it was you have to have, um, have a negative IgG, but that is not the case um, anymore. Anybody can get it and should get it. Um, at Stanford, currently IgG negative patients are being prioritized, but still all immunocompromised patients can receive it. Um, there is a limited supply um, and we, it has been somewhat slow to roll out um, and supply kind of varies based on location. So I think it is also important for people to check with local providers regarding availability and basically just get it um, at the first place you have the, the chance to. Um, people seem to tolerate it pretty well. Um, there was about a 5% um, report of kind of headache and fatigue. Those were the major side effects people had. Timing of vaccination comes up a lot um, in terms of a question. So 
if you have just gotten your COVID-19 vaccine, you should probably at least wait, uh, sorry, you should probably wait at least two weeks to get the Evashield. And this is basically so your body can have a chance to have the maximum um, effect from the vaccine. Um, you don't necessarily wanna stunt that by giving yourself um, antibodies. Uh, once you've received a monoclonal antibody, whether it be the Evashield or Sotrivimab or you know, some other sort of treatment, um, you, it is not necessary to delay COVID-19 vaccination. This is something that's changed over time as well. Previously, we were saying wait 90 days, um, but now um, the recommendation is that you can just go ahead and get it, um, if you're due anyway, to get your booster or your third dose or something. Um, so future directions. Um, I have learned definitely that, um, uh, that I should not try to predict anything about um, coronavirus or the pandemic. So my crystal ball is, is definitely cloudy. Um, but I just wanna, wanna, I guess, focus on the fact that, you know, a lot of work is, is um, is being done um, to continue to try to um, protect um, this community and um, and you know continue to strive to to better treatments and better outcomes. So there's currently at least 15 clinical trials ongoing at Stanford for various um, diagnostics and treatments. Um, I also wanted to mention that this monoclonal antibody. Bebtilovimab was recently um, approved for treatment. Um, and the exciting thing about this is it does seem to have um, better activity, um, even better activity against um, you know, current um, emerging variants. Um, and it likely will be available in the near future um, at Stanford um, for administration. So um, we're continuing to uh, aim to um, protect people in the new normal, I guess. So how to best protect yourself. I think, um, you know, basically to review what we've been talking about, get vaccinated with a three dose series followed by the booster. Um, ensure your family members and caregivers are vaccinated as well. Get the Evashield um, injection when available. Um, I think this question is, is um, you know, in terms of how to interact with society, et cetera, um, is a little harder to answer. I think that, um, you know, clearly it would be impossible for anybody to have existed in a, in a bubble for the last two years um, in a healthy, you know, and, and kind of maintain some, some healthy mental health. Um, so, you know, I, I like to just um, give some advice on how you can kind of most say, safely um, interact. Um, you know, I think, of course, avoiding contact with someone who is sick. Um, that's something everybody here has been good about even before the pandemic. Washing hands frequently. If you are meeting up with family or friends, you know, consider doing so outside, um, socially distanced, wearing a mask. Um, and, and I, will note that you know, N95 or N99 masks do provide um, better protection against Omicron than, <clears throat> than surgical masks. Um, so I think that's all I have. Happy to take questions. Um, yeah, well, we had a few questions come in, Dr. Nelson, but you covered them all in your subsequent slides. So, um, but thank you for that. And thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your time and, um, and sharing that information with us. So sure. now our next speaker is uh, Matthew Defina. Matt is a 44 year old cystic fibrosis and double lung transplant patient here at Stanford. He has received two double lung transplants, the first in 2012 and the second in 2020. He is husband to Denise and a father of 14 year old Gracie. He has a bachelor's degree in kinesiology from Fresno State and an MBA from St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. He and his wife own and operate a winery called Dufina Family Cellars in Napa Valley. 
And in his spare time, he coaches volleyball, basketball, and is a competitive athlete himself. Uh, a 14-time medal winner at both the World Transplant Games and Donate Life Transplant Games. So thank you for being with us today, Matt. Hey, thanks for that introduction. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you to the PFSC uh, committee for having me today. Um, I'm excited to share my story. Um, I hope that everybody finds this helpful. Um, I have had a lot of coffee today, so I'm really amped up. So please bear with me. Uh, it's been a long couple of days uh, for me, um, which is why I've had so much coffee today. Uh, my family and I were down at Disneyland for the past few days. Um, my daughter's choir from school was selected to, uh, to perform at a music festival that they were doing at Disneyland. So that was really exciting and um, a lot of fun to, to uh, hear my daughter and her classmates sing at Disneyland. Um, and uh, while we were there, I, I rode the uh, ride the Incredicoaster. And um, I find this very appropriate that this happens to be my favorite ride in all of Disneyland. Uh, because like Dr. Cher alluded to during her presentation, uh, life in, in the transplant world, as well as with cystic fibrosis, is definitely a roller coaster. Um, I'm sure that everybody out there um, can agree with that. Uh, it's been an emotional roller coaster, a physical roller coaster, um, especially in the last couple of years with, uh, with the COVID virus that we've been dealing with. And I'll certainly talk about that a little bit as well. Um, but basically, I just wanted to come on here and, uh, and just give a very candid and honest uh, look at my life and some of the things that I've been through. Um, I, I did recently have COVID myself, and uh, I'll talk about that a little bit as well. But uh, I think what I'd like to do is just sort of uh, go back a ways and uh, just give a little bit of a chronological uh, outlook on, uh, on my life. So, um, like you said, I'm 44 years old. Uh, if you do the math, that means I was born in 1977. Um, saying that makes me sound super old. Um, and, uh, if you ask my daughter, she'll definitely, uh, tell you that I'm super old. Um, but, uh, in 77, as many of you know, there was not nearly as much known about cystic fibrosis as there is today. Uh, the outlook wasn't as good. Uh, back then, it was definitely considered a childhood disease because, unfortunately, many patients did not make it uh, beyond their childhood years. Um, I was diagnosed with CF at 20 days old. Um, I had meuconium ileus, which was the very first symptom that led the doctors to suspect that I had cystic fibrosis. Um, and then at 20 days old, they did the sweat test on me. And the sweat test confirmed that I did indeed have this disease. Um, based on that sweat test and the severity of my symptoms, my parents were told that I would not live to be four years old. And uh, like you said, though, today I am 44 years old. So I have uh, surpassed that prognosis 11 fold. So I'm pretty proud of that. And, um, you know, I want to just, again, convey to everybody out there that uh, again, no matter what the prognosis, no matter how grim the outlook is, never give up and always persevere. Anything is possible. Um, and uh, again, we'll talk more about that too. Um, so during my first few years of life, uh, it was really touch and go. I was hospitalized probably about 50 times uh, with all sorts of complications due to cystic fibrosis. Um, but by the time I was in elementary school, my health uh, definitely began to stabilize. Uh, when I was probably around third or fourth grade, I started riding my bike to school every single day. Um, I did all of the things that little boys do, such as uh, playing sports and, uh, and chasing girls at recess, one of my favorite things, um, and uh, also played a lot of sports. I was a very active uh, an athletic little kid, um, and I definitely believe that uh, staying very active definitely benefited my health um, all through uh, all through elementary school and um, and high school. Uh, I played lots of sports, um, 
I'm going to do a quick uh, screen share here so you can uh, see a couple a couple of picks. Um, one of my favorite sports in high school was tennis. Uh, this is a nice little pick. I don't know about that mustache there, but that was me. Uh, I believe my junior year. Um, so uh, tennis, track and field, basketball, those were all some of my uh, favorite sports when I was a kid. Um, by the time I got into college, I was probably um, I was probably the peak of my health. I think my um, my lung function was probably at the highest point uh, it was at that point prior to my transplant. Um, and uh, and I earned a bachelor's of science degree from Fresno State University uh, in kinesiology. And that's also where I met the love of my life, Denise. And uh, we got married a few years um, after after my graduation. Um, as far as my health is concerned, like I said, I was pretty healthy all through college. Um, during my college years is actually when I experienced my first bowel obstruction and had surgery uh, to do a bowel resection there. Um, and I was really pretty healthy uh, throughout most of my 20s. Um, it wasn't until I was about 32 that my lung function really began to steeply decline. Um, as many of you know, cystic fibrosis is a progressive disease and Despite doing everything correctly and everything that my physicians told me to do, uh, such as taking in proper nutrition, um, doing all of my, uh, my chest physiotherapy treatments, taking all my medications, seeing my doctors frequently, uh, unfortunately, my lung function uh, did continue to decline. Um, by the time I was 32, um, that's when doctors started talking to me about lung transplant. I believe my lung function was probably around 30% at that time. By the time I was 34, my lung function had dwindled down to about 20%. Um, at that point, I was going to Stanford, and I remember distinctly the, uh, the conversation I had with Dr. Mohibir at that point in time. Um, it was in April of 2012 that uh, I remember. I remember Dr. Moabir coming into the, to my room. I was hospitalized for an exacerbation, and he told my wife and I that I was only looking at probably two years left to live unless I received a double lung transplant. Um, at that point, uh, to be honest with you, I had kind of, uh, I, I wasn't opposed to transplant, but I was mentally at a point where I was really trying to prolong transplant as long as possible. Um, but hearing Dr. Mohibir uh, say those words really uh, kind of flipped a switch in me, and, uh, and that helped me um, to agree to, to moving forward with, with a lung transplant. So I was added to the lung transplant list on April 26th of 2012. Um, my family and I were told that it would probably about six, be about six months to a year before I received that transplant. Uh, but lo and behold, I got my call two and a half weeks later. So that was a bit of a surprise to us. Uh, I don't think we were mentally, emotionally, or even physically prepared for us to receive that call that quick. Um, it was a bit of an extraordinary experience, but uh, nonetheless, we, we uh, drove to Stanford right away. I remember we received that call at six o'clock in the morning. So we fought our way through the Bay Area morning traffic and made it to Stanford in about three hours. Um, and, uh, and we went forward with the transplant. I didn't have a dry run. So um, I, we had that, I was able to receive that transplant on the first shot and that was nice. Um, Dr. Richard Ha was my surgeon and he did an outstanding job. Um, and the, uh, the, transplant the transplant team, including Dr. Dillon, uh, did an outstanding job in my post-operative care. Um, and so that was May 15th of 2012 when that occurred. Um, despite, uh, despite receiving the transplant and everything going really well, I did actually start to develop some episodes of rejection about a year out. Um, at first, uh, I think I had a couple of episodes of acute rejection um, but then by the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, 
I was diagnosed with chronic rejection. Um, I began photophoresis treatments and the photophoresis treatments really helped to stabilize my lung function, um, which sort of halted my the lung function decline at about 40%, 35%, somewhere in that area. And I was able to pretty much live at about 30% to 35% lung function for the next few years. Um, one of the things that I discovered during that time was uh, something called the Transplant Games of America. And this is something that's been a big highlight um, in my life. Um, I'll share a couple of pictures from that. The, uh, the Transplant Games of America um, is, uh, is an, an extraordinary event that's a lot of fun. Um, it's now called the Donate Life Transplant Games. Um, and uh, the first, my first experience was in 20, uh, 2016, excuse me, um, and I went to Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, I was able to bring home seven medals, two gold, two silver, and three bronze medals. Uh, the events that I competed in were doubles tennis, track and field. Um, this is a picture of me right here running the 200 meter run in track and field. Uh, I also played volleyball, basketball, um, and let's see if I got another one here. Uh, uh, there we go. And, um, and racquetball. Um, I also uh, did some swimming events as well. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and the transplant games, for those of you who don't know, it's just an, an extraordinary event that really shows the world that transplantation works. Um, even though my lung function was around 35 to 40% at that time, I was still able to go and compete. Um, and uh, I've always been someone who just really pushes themselves to the limits. Um, you know, the great, the great NFL coach, Tony Dungy, once said uh, that you can't always control circumstances, but you can always control your attitude, your approach, and your response. Um, and I love that quote. That's a, a good quote that I really have come to live by over the last few years, especially. Um, and I always just try to maintain a positive attitude um, no matter what's going on. And, uh, and again, just always try to push myself um, and never give up and always persevere no matter what the circumstances. Um, in addition to the Transplant Games of America, or the Donate Life Transplant Games, there's also the World Transplant Games that I've also um, enjoyed participating in. My first uh, transplant games, my first World Transplant Games was actually in, in uh, Malaga, Spain of 2017. Um, and at that, at that uh, World Transplant Games, I participated in track and field. Um, as well as volleyball, uh, um, I'm sorry, not volleyball, basketball. And during those events, um, we won the gold medal in, our, in our, our basketball. And I also won the silver medal in, um, in the men's javelin. So that was exciting and a lot of fun. Um, the next transplant games will actually be this summer. And that's going to be in San Diego, and that's going to be the Donate Life Transplant Games uh, here in the U.S. And then in 2023, we'll be going to Perth, Australia to compete in the next World Transplant Games. So we're looking forward to that. Um, let's see, that brings me up to about uh, 2020 when the pandemic started. And uh, unfortunately, in around 2019, uh, my lung transplant, my, I'm sorry, my chronic rejection uh, did continue to uh, sort of take its toll on my lung function and my, my lung function began to decline again even more. Uh, by that point, I was down to about 22% and uh, back on oxygen full time. And the team had started talking to me again uh, about, uh, about retransplant. And so it was in October of 2019 that I was added to the transplant list once again. Um, 
And <clears throat> as you all know, it was around January of 2020 when COVID popped up and we started seeing lots of COVID cases. Hospitals all over the country were just overrun. Um, emergency departments, ICUs, uh, absolutely filled with COVID patients. And back in the beginning, it was frankly a very scary time, um, especially for those of us who are immunocom uh, immunocompromised. Um, thinking about the possibility of getting COVID um, and also being at that point where I needed to go through another transplant um, was something that was a bit scary. Um, and in fact, with so many questions at that time and, and you know, not knowing and with so many uncertainties about this disease and, um, and how, how contagious it was and what all the hospitals were doing, I actually chose to sort of pause myself, if you will, on the transplant list um, in January of 2020. And I wanted to wait and sort of just wait it out and see uh, how things progressed uh, with regards to COVID, uh, COVID cases and so forth. Um, at that time, and part of that was also due to the fact that, uh, that at that time, Stanford uh, had really locked down their visitors policy. Um, and for my family and I, uh, we made the choice for me to basically put things on hold because the thought of me essentially going through this transplant again by myself in the hospital was something that would have added a another layer of emotional stress to the whole situation um, for both my wife and daughter as well as myself and so we so we paused things and a few months later Stanford relaxed its policy a little bit um, and allowed one visitor per patient per hospitalization uh, which was much more doable for us um, because um, my, because my wife and daughter, excuse me, my wife and daughter, uh, could then, uh, could then be my visitors since my daughter was a minor, she was allowed to come along, uh, with my wife to be my, my visitor during, during my, during my transplant. So fast forward to July of 2020 and, um, I got the call, um, to receive my second double lung transplant. Um, and uh, here is a picture of me laying on the operating room table in my final moments uh, right before my second transplant. Um, this time, Dr. John MacArthur was my, was my surgeon and he did an outstanding job. Um, Dr. MacArthur and his team did a great job in the OR as well as with my post-operative care. Uh, again, Dr. Dillon and the rest of the, of the transplant team also did a great job in my post-operative care. Um, here's a, a pic of me on August 3rd, 2020. This is a few days, uh, actually about a week or two after my transplant. Um, but, uh, but of course, this transplant process went great. This is a picture of me off, uh, off the oxygen, but with 100% oxygen saturation on room air. Um, and so things were, things went well. This hospitalization was, uh, quite a bit longer than the first time around. Um, my first, my first transplant actually went incredibly smooth. I was only in the ICU for a day and a half. And then, um, I was, I was moved down to a step down unit, uh, a couple of, a couple of days later. Um, and I was then discharged altogether on day nine. And I was back in the gym working out on day 12. Um, that was the first time around. The second time around, I had a couple of complications. Um, I developed a pneumothorax that required um, a stent to be placed. Um, and I also had, uh, they, they discovered that I had some blood clots that needed to be surgically removed. And so that also caused um, a little bit of a complication. Uh, you can see right here is where the, uh, the blood clot uh, was formed and I developed a nice little hematoma right there as well. Um, and, uh, and so I ended up being in the hospital a total of 32 days for my second transplant. Um, but things, things went well, my recovery went well. Um, 
and uh, and that was my my second transplant. Um, since then, uh, things have have been going pretty smooth, um, despite the the whole COVID pandemic. Um, life for me hasn't changed a whole lot, if I'm being honest, uh, because ever since my first transplant, uh, I've been pretty diligent about wearing masks and, and staying away from sick people um, and, uh, and always heeding the advice of my physicians. And those are all things that, uh, that I continue to do. Um, in, in fact, uh, since I'm on here, I, I do want to just reassure my team that's listening that when I was in Disneyland, I was wearing a mask the entire time. So don't worry. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, I mean, when I look around and see the rest of society wearing masks, it actually gives me a bit more, a bit more comfort right now. Um, I feel a bit more safer because so many people around me are also wearing their masks now for many years. I felt like I was the only one and other transplant patients were the only ones, uh, wearing masks when they, uh, when they were out in public and, uh, now it's everybody. So that's actually a bit more comforting to see that. Um, and so, so, you know, uh, as far as the new norm goes for me, um, you know, I just sort of take things day by day. Um, I'm very careful about who, who I hang out with. I try to hang out with, with people who've also been vaccinated like myself. Um, obviously I'm very aware of, uh, of who's sick and um, things like that and try to avoid people who, who are sick at the time. But like I said, uh, the main thing is, is being vaccinated, wearing my mask as often as possible. Um, and those seem to be the, uh, the, big, the big things to do these days to keep, to keep us all healthy. Um, I did, I, like I said earlier, I did end up catching COVID in January. Um, my experience with COVID, um, to be honest, my experience was there were a couple of things that were a little different about my experience than what Dr. Nelson shared. Um, when I developed COVID in January, um, I was not able to receive the monoclonal antibodies because at that time, I don't know if this is how it's still done, but at Stanford, I was told that for the monoclonal antibody treatments, uh, so trivimab, it was, there was a lottery system. And um, unfortunately, I was not picked in the lottery system. And so the option, the only option that was presented to me was to receive remdesivir. Um, and I did receive remdesivir. It was a three-day um, three infusion, uh, which was done on an outpatient basis um, at the infusion center over at Hoover Pavilion. Um, the COVID illness itself, um, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to take a wild guess that I did have the Omicron variant because the COVID illness itself was not that bad. Um, I, the, the symptoms, the main symptoms I had were, were chills, but no fever. Uh, I did develop a, um, a runny nose, um, I had some overall body soreness and muscle aches and things like that. And more than anything, just kind of a general feeling of, uh, of fatigue and just sort of being run down. Um, those were the, the first symptoms that I had. Um, and then I started the remdesivir treatment. Almost immediately, all of those symptoms went away. However, I then developed um, some very intense um, nausea as a side effect to the remdesivir. And I was told that that was most likely what was happening um, was the nausea that I was feeling was, was the side effect to the remdesivir. Um, the remdesivir nausea was, was pretty intense. It was for about three, three days, the whole time that I was on remdesivir, um, it was near constant. Um, and I'm not going to lie, it was pretty bad. But, uh, but then again, I'm also a huge sissy when it comes to nausea and GI symptoms. You know, you can give me a lung transplant and that kind of thing any day of the week. But, uh, but with nausea, uh, I'll cry like a baby. <laughs> That's just me. Um, and so, you know, nausea, though, you know, you can take, uh, you can take Zofran and, um, and Pepto-Bismol and things like that. And uh, that, that definitely does help. Um, 
after the room desivir, after my third room desivir treatment, almost just like flipping on a light switch, uh, the nausea did go away. So that also um, kind of leads me to believe that it was definitely a side effect to the room desivir. Um, but since then, uh, I've recovered really well. My appetite, my energy, my lung function, everything is back up to normal. Um, I've, uh, you know, I've continued working out and exercising. And like I said, I was just at Disneyland and walked over 20,000 steps a day for uh, three consecutive days without any issues. And, uh, and so, so things are going well. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a, a, a reader's digest version of, of my journey with, with cystic fibrosis and lung transplant, um, as well as my experience with COVID uh, about a month, month and a half ago. Um, so I, I will open it up right now if anybody has any questions specifically that they would like to ask me uh, about my experience, I'm happy to share. Um, uh, again, one of the quotes that I often uh, like to, to share is, uh, is from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, and uh, that is, if you don't find the time, if you don't do the work, you don't get the results. And uh, that has been a, a big one for me. Um, working out is always, has always been something um, that's uh, been a big part of my life. Um, this here is a, uh, a picture that I'll share with everyone that just kind of shows here I am on, uh, August 18th of 2020, a few days, actually about a month post double lung transplant. Um, and then this is what I looked like 11 months later. Um, and then this is me about one year post transplant. Um, uh, so again, I would just encourage everybody out there who is facing lung transplant um, whether you're pre-transplant or post-transplant to just be patient, be consistent and trust the process. Um, and also trust your physicians and their expertise. Um, and again, just never give up, always persevere, uh, and just keep, keep pushing through, um, and always try to maintain a positive attitude. That's, uh, that's been, I think the biggest, um, the biggest thing for me has always been trying to uh, to be positive, and even uh, and even be a little bit humorous and laugh at yourself at times. So, um, so that's my story. Um, like I said, I'll I'll take any questions if anybody uh, has any spe anything specific they'd like to ask me. Hi, Matt. So, Matt, oh, oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. Okay. Um, one of the questions, thank you so much for your incredibly inspirational story. Truly amazing. Um, one of the questions that we received was, what mask do you wear? Any thoughts on how you caught COVID with all the precautions you take? Yeah, that's a great question. The answer to that is I have no clue whatsoever how I caught it or where I caught it or who I caught it from. Um, my wife and daughter and I, we actually all three of us had COVID at the same time. So um, no idea, but we all tested positive at the same time too. We all did the, the home tests first and then did the, uh, the PCR test to confirm. Um, and we all, we all three of us did that on the same day. So I don't know if I caught it and gave it to them or one of them caught it and gave it to us. Um, you know, there's, unfortunately, I, I don't know how we could, determine where we got it from or who we caught it from. Um, I do coach basketball and it's currently basketball season. Um, so I'm on campus at my daughter's school quite a bit. It's possible I could have gotten it from, from another kid at school. Um, my team, uh, it's a requirement for my team to wear masks all the time. So when I'm around my, uh, my players in the gym, they're all masked up. My, co my assistant coaches are masked up um, and I'm masked up as well. So, you know, we do everything we can to keep ourselves safe in that environment, but you never know. So um, I do have an N95 mask. Uh, that's my, my choice of mask uh, that, I, that I always wear. Obviously that's, 
the mask that's that I think that's most recommended from from physicians, um, and uh, and that I think for the most part has kept me really safe. Um, so um, so that's the mask I wear. Okay. When Personal question, what sports are you going to pursue at the upcoming transplant games? So I don't enter those. <laughs> yeah, no, that, thanks for that. Um, I haven't fully decided. Uh, the schedule The schedule is kind of crazy for the San Diego games. Um, unfortunately, I can't do all of the sports that I would like to um, because some of the sports are scheduled at the same time. And so there's just timing conflicts there. I'm definitely going to be part of the basketball team again. Um, I'll also be part of the volleyball team, and I will I will likely do cycling, and track and field, and I've also developed quite an interest in the sport of pickleball, and so I will be playing pickleball uh, probably on the last day of the event as well. The the one of the things that's different is the donate life transplant games does put a limit on the number of sports that you can participate in, and that is five. Um, the World Transplant Games, um, the World Transplant Games allows you to, uh, to, to participate in more if you choose. So, um, so I'll, I'll probably keep it at five sports for, um, for the Donate Life Games in San Diego. Okay, let's do one other question. Um, do you keep a six foot distance from your masked friends? Absolutely. Yeah, that's I, I find social distancing to be uh, also imperative to our safety. Um, whenever possible, I always keep, you know, it, well, at least six feet. But if I can step back and, you know, even stay back a little further than that, sometimes I'll do that as well. Um, in Disneyland, that was kind of challenging because it was so crowded in lines and so forth. Um, but in situations like that, I, you know, if you can't social distance at least six feet, then, uh, the next best thing is to obviously make sure you're wearing that mask, uh, especially it's an N95 mask at all times to protect yourself. Um, but when I'm at the grocery store, or, um, or out and about, you know, when I'm in the gym coaching my players, um, you know, and I'm in situations that I can control. Um, I'm definitely staying six feet away or more whenever I can, for sure. Okay. So um, one last question. How do you manage your daughter's friends and school? So my, both my wife and daughter um, are, are great caregivers for me. Um, my daughter is now 14 years old. She's been there every step of the way. Um, when, I, when I had my first transplant, she was three years old. So this whole lifestyle to her is nothing new. And she understands the, um, the gravity of everything that's going on and, and, how, um, and how severe it could be if she brings home an illness. So she's great about keeping her mask on uh, even when she's at school. Um, fortunately, she goes to a private school and their school uh, actually still has rules um, to, to maintain masks in the classroom. Um, and even when she's outside, when she's around her friends, she keeps her mask on uh, in an effort to, to keep herself safe because she knows that it could be bad if she gets sick, even not with COVID, but even with the flu or a cold or anything else. Um, she doesn't want to bring anything like that home to me or to my wife. Um, and same thing with my wife, all of my friends and everyone uh, who knows me knows about my situation and that uh, any kind of illness could be detrimental to my health, um, obviously, because not only the illness itself, but knowing that illness can also cause rejection. Um, and so most of my friends, uh, like I said, are aware of that. And fortunately, they, they've all been really good about, um, about being respectful of wearing masks around me. Um, and same thing with my daughter and my daughter's friends as well. Okay. Um, another question is, do you allow friends inside your home now? We do if they're vaccinated. Um, and, uh, and also if, you know, if they have a mask, if they can wear a mask, um, we will, my wife and I have allowed that. Um, for folks who are, for friends of ours who are not vaccinated, um, we've, we've kind of put the kibosh on, on letting those people inside our home. 
Um, we'll still see those people outside, but again, maintain social distance and keep our masks on when we're around people who are unvaccinated. Okay, also do your wife and daughter wear N95 masks? Yeah, yeah, we all have N95 masks that we wear um, whenever possible. If, you know, if for some reason we forget our masks, we leave masks in our cars. Mm -hmm. So we have masks with us at all times. Um, and uh, the masks I think we keep in our cars are the, the black disposable masks, similar to the ones that they have at the hospital. Um, and so that's kind of our, our last resort mask that we'll wear if, uh, if we happen to forget our N95 masks. But, um, but we make an effort to keep masks with us at all times, everywhere we go. So, uh, so we're always protecting ourselves as much as we can. Okay, and we all hope that you continue to protect yourself and stay well. And um, I would like to, are there any other questions that want to be submitted? I'll wait a minute, see if anything's coming in the chat. Well, I just want to say, leave you with one last quote. My absolute favorite quote is that life is not measured by the number of breaths that you take, but by the moments which take your breath away. So never take a single breath for granted. And, uh, you know, live life to the fullest as much as you can. Um, and I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I hope that my story uh, has inspired at least one of you out there. If it's inspired at least just one person, then I'll, I'll feel like this is a success. And um, again, I'm happy to answer questions. If anybody wants to reach out to me privately, I'm more than happy to talk to people. Um, you can. Um, you can uh, reach out to me. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. And um, my email address is matthew.defina at gmail.com. Um, and so you can, can get a hold of me uh, that way as well. Thank you so much, Matt. We really wonderful to see you. We really appreciate you being here with us today. I'd like to thank so much to all of our wonderful speakers this afternoon. We do welcome follow-up questions that can be submitted to our PFAC email, which can be found in our newsletter articles that have been sent via My Health. For reference, our email is dl-lung-pfac at stanfordhealthcare.org. As a PFAC, we strive to improve the patient and family experience going through the lung transplant journey. Please, if you are interested in participating in our PFAC, let your transplant clinic social worker know. We are always looking for new members to bring ideas and projects forward for us to pursue. On behalf of our PFAC, I would like to thank all of our speakers and you, the audience, for participating in our virtual town hall this afternoon. We hope you all stay healthy and continue to join us at future PFAC events. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon.